All right, so this evening I've already told you what we're going to do. We're going to compare the God we see in nature with the God we see in the Bible, and then we're going to compare it, uh, what we see in nature with what other religions are saying about the God they believe has revealed them, himself to them. So let me begin with a text of Scripture that reminds us that uh, there is a revelation from God, and I will make um, reference to this, uh, at least in one place in, in this um, lecture slash sermon. Romans 1, 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And, and again, God is judging mankind for hiding, suppressing, covering over what it is they know about him from the creation. And that's what he goes on to explain, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. And again, yes, they're, they're already without excuse, but because they suppress that knowledge, it's helpful for us to be able to point those things out to them to remove the cover that they have placed over it so they come face to face again with God. Now again, what we're looking at, of course, is uh, we, we're reviewing the natural attribute, well, we're reviewing what nature reveals about God and we've moved on to, um, to Scripture. So that's what we've been looking at so far in the series. So nature shows us that God is and what he's like gives us a rather full picture, actually. I remember what uh, I told you John Gerster said about this, that many natural theologians learn more about God from the creation than most Christians do by reading their Bibles, and that's because most Christians don't pay too much attention to what their Bibles say, most professing Christians. Okay, but we saw that knowing that God is from the creation, we know then that there is a possibility of there being a word from him. So we know God exists, and if God exists, then it is possible, a word is possible. Next we saw that the Bible claims to be his word. Okay, so here's at least one book among a few that claim to be the word of God. And then we looked at the fact that Jesus, who was divinely authenticated by God, not only by doing miracles in general by which God would authenticate other messengers, but miracles that were specific to the Messiah tells us that the entire Old Testament, the words that he speaks and those of his apostles and close associates are the word of God. And so we spent a little bit of time looking at the fact that on the basis of Jesus' testimony, um, the 66 books of the Bible are God's Word. Now, remember that R.C. said that we can, we can come to that conclusion even if the Bible isn't the Word of God because when we come to the Bible, we don't want to say the Bible is the Word of God and what it claims about itself is true, therefore it is the Word of God because that is a circular argument, but rather coming to the Bible as reliable historic document that contains... Um, eyewitness testimony, that's how uh, we, we prove it. So remember, we can't verify everything in the Bible. We can't reproduce the miracles that took place and, and show that to anyone. But what can be verified in the Bible has been verified through archaeology, and that's one of the things we looked at last week. Remember William F. Albright who is an American archaeologist, biblical scholar, and philologist, who is one who studies the history of languages, in the 20th century wrote in his article entitled, History, Archaeology, and Christian Humanism. He says, thanks to modern research, we now recognize the Bible's substantial historicity. The narratives of the patriarchs, of Moses and the Exodus, of the conquest of Canaan, of the judges, the monarchy, exile, and restoration have all been confirmed and illustrated to an extent that I should have thought impossible 40 years ago. Now, the reason I repeat that is because uh, you and I can't really 
authenticate what the Bible says. It, you know, we'd have to um, get some pretty serious education, perhaps earn a PhD, and then go out and do some research, and, and that would take a very long time. And so, like in many other areas, there are things in which we need to trust others, like we do R.C. Sproul to, to teach us reliable theology, right? We, we trust that he has the credentials, and he's going to teach us the truth, and he shows us that truth. Well, we do that in many different areas, and we, we need to do that here as well, but here is one very highly respected, well-known archaeologist who tells us the Old Testament is reliable history, and perhaps more importantly, Sir William Ramsey, a British New Testament scholar, says the same thing about the New Testament. He writes this, I take the view that Luke's history is unsurpassed in its trustworthiness. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian, and they will stand the keenest scrutiny and the harshest treatment. So he believed you could put that to the test and that Luke will come out as a reliable historian. Now that, that's important because uh, Luke's gospel is the longest. And I do think that it does verify uh, the history that's contained in the other gospels. And then when you consider the book of Acts that covers the history behind most of the New Testament letters, we, we see that the, the history of the New Testament has also been uh, verified, uh, again, through expert scholarship. We don't have to be intimidated by those who would say the Bible is inaccurate. It has actually been proven. So the New Testament documents are reliable records of what Jesus said and what Jesus did, containing many eyewitness accounts proving that he is a messenger from God and that what he says about the Bible is true that it is God's Word, okay? So eyewitness testimony to Jesus' divine credentials, and Jesus says the Bible is His Word. Now, tonight we're going to consider another argument, I think, further to prove that the Bible is God's Word because it is the only book making this claim that to be the Bible or to be God's Word that actually reveals the God that we see in nature. Now, this, as I've said, will all give us the opportunity to again to review natural revelation, compare it with what the Bible says about him. And of course, we would expect the two to be consistent if, if the God of, that we see in creation actually inspired the Bible. I'd also like to make some applications as I mentioned before. But then I want to compare it to what the other religions who claim to have a God and a word from God say about God to see if it's the same God that we see in, in the creation. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's begin by comparing the God we see in general revelation with the God of the Bible, and as you might suspect, it's going to agree perfectly. Now, remember, we first saw from nature that God is eternal. Something exists now. So something has always existed because something cannot come from nothing. There is something that is eternal. So what does the Bible say about God? Well, we've already seen in our meditation, Moses writes this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And this word everlasting here means forever. It means always, it means eternal existence. You, you know, God's existence goes eternally both directions into the past and, and into the future. The psalmist wrote in, in our call to worship, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And then the Lord says through Isaiah in Isaiah 57, verse 15, for thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and, um, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So this is what the high and exalted one who lives forever says. So with God, there is no beginning. There is no end. God is eternal. And I think, you know, again, I, I'll just ask you to, to meditate on the lyrics of that hymn that we sang, you know, at the beginning, because it, it fits so perfectly. God's um, eternality means for us, okay, that God has loved us 
from all eternity. Remember how you know, God is infinite in all of his attributes. God knows absolutely everything that, that ever will happen and everything that could ever possibly happen under any given set of circumstances. Uh, there's even occasions in Scripture where David says, you know, if I did this, Lord, what would happen? And he tells him what would happen, and so then he does something else <laughs> so that that doesn't happen. I mean, God knows what's going to happen even you know, under any given set of circumstances because there's nothing he can possibly learn. Well, he's also never learned anything about us. You know, God has known us from all eternity. God has foreloved us, the Bible says, from all eternity. Um, and having loved us and sent his son, as we saw this morning, uh, to save us, he will also never let us go. I told you before, uh, I'm sure I've used this illustration, that one of our elders uh, who's gone to be with the Lord, Neva's husband, uh, Dick Nielsen, used to pray this virtually every single Sunday when we'd uh, meet together for prayer. He would thank God that his love for us would never end because it has no beginning. And I'm, hopefully you understood what that actually means, but what it means is that it, it's eternally with God. His love for us is eternal. It, it's not something that started in time. He didn't, you know, look ahead and say, oh, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose to love you, love you, and so forth. But knowing us eternally, he has loved us, not because we're lovely, <laughs> but only because he has chosen to do that. But because that's true, you see, it's not going to end ever. He is always going to love us. Now, secondly, we see that he is infinite, that he is everywhere. Um, since it's impossible that there could be nothing somewhere, nothing anywhere, uh, this, go this being who exists from eternity, God, must be everywhere. And that's, again, what we see in the Bible. Solomon writes in 2 Chronicles 2, 6, But who is able to build a house for him? For the heavens and the highest heavens cannot contain him. So who am I that I should build a house for him except to burn incense before him? Uh, God is, is infinite. Jeremiah says, or the Lord speaking through Jeremiah says, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? And then, of course, that's Jeremiah 23, 23 through 24. And then David in that very familiar psalm, Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you were there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you were there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. So God is everywhere. There's, there's no way to escape his presence, not that we would want to, but we do need to remember that since God is everywhere, sometimes we conceive of God as just being in heaven. And maybe he doesn't see what's going on. But the fact is, he is just as present here as he is in heaven, though he is revealing himself in a different way. And Jonathan Edwards said on one occasion that whatever we do in our private lives, it's as if we've climbed up into heaven <laughs> standing before the throne of God and we are doing it there. See, that's how present God is. So that's one thing to think about when we make our decisions, when we make our choices of what we do, it is in the presence of God. But the comforting thing is, of course, His love for us never changes, and, and that's good. But wherever we go, we're never outside of His watchful eye or His protection. God is present with us, and nothing is going to happen to us outside of His will. Now, third, we, we saw that He is one. Remember, He is infinite and eternal, as we've just seen, but there can only be one infinite, one unlimited being, because multiple beings would limit each other. And if they're finite, you can never add up enough of them to equal an infinite. There must, if there's a, an infinite being, it must be one being. And not surprisingly, the Bible says that this God who is eternal and infinite is only one. Uh, this is the great confession of the Jews, Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. 
Now this means, among other things, that there is nothing, there is nothing that truly exists apart from Him. We owe our existence, of course, to Him. And this also means that there is nothing that can stand in God's way, nothing to challenge Him, because He is the one who exists, the one who eternally is, the only one who exists. So nothing can stop Him from fulfilling His promises to us, perhaps at some point in our lives, and hopefully we don't think this way anymore, that the devil was like an equal or opposing, he is an opposing force, but certainly not an equal one. I mean, sometime in our Christian life, we might have thought that. But the devil and all of his demons combined are infinitely less than God and cannot possibly overcome him. Now, fourth, he is independent. Remember, he doesn't depend on anything else for his existence. To be infinite, as Jonathan Edwards would say, is to be all. And if he's all, there is nothing else that he could depend on. Okay? Paul said to the Athenian philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 24 through 25, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. God doesn't need anything from us. Uh, we need everything from him. So this, this could just be a reminder to us that we don't add anything to God when we worship him. He didn't create us because he needed our worship. He created us essentially to worship him so that we would be blessed because in worshiping Him, we are blessed. So that it's all, it, again, God is, is independent. And also being independent means that there's nothing He depends on to, to exist or to carry out His will. So if there was, that thing could fail. And then He could fail. But that's not possible. God is, doesn't depend on anything, so He is going to be able to carry through everything that He has promised <clears throat> that He would do. Fifthly, <coughs> he never changes. To be infinite and so to be all and independent means that there is nothing else besides God that can interact with him to make him change. And we see that also in Scripture, James 1.17. By the way, all of these things also flow out of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, they recognize that this is what God reveals about himself, and, and they, there are texts in there that they use to support this. James writes this in James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God doesn't change. The Lord says through Malachi in Malachi 3.6, for I the Lord do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And think about the comfort of that. We will in just a moment. The author to the Hebrews also writes this in Hebrews 1, 11 through 12, and here he's referring to Christ. They, speaking of the created universe, will perish, but you remain, and they all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up like a garment, they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. Now again, the Lord doesn't change. Therefore, His purposes towards us will never change. God will never change His mind through all the endless years to come. He will never grow tired of us. He will never change His attitude towards us. He will never cast us away. But His love will remain the same because this being an, uh, an eternal love is a changeless love. And, and you can see the connection between those particular things. Sixth, he is the, the cause of the material universe. He is the creator. Again, because he's the only one who could be, the only one who exists. So Moses writes in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John writes in John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Christ, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And then the author to the Hebrews in Hebrews 1.10, we just quoted the author to the Hebrews, but this is one more verse. You, Lord, speaking of Christ, 
In the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. So we, we understand this being must have created the things we see. The Bible says God did that. God is the absolute creator and maker of all things. Let's not forget to whom we owe everything. Seventh, he must be personal, self-aware, intelligent, purposeful, and moral. And we know that because we have these attributes. And we cannot have anything he doesn't have. Because if that were the case, you know, God must have what we have and greater. Otherwise, something greater would come from something less, lesser. And that is, as we know, impossible. The effect cannot be greater than the cause. That is a universal truth that we see to be true. I don't think there are, I mean, there aren't any exceptions to it. Well, Moses writes in Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The one who created us created us in his image. God, we, we possess what, what God possesses, at least in a limited sense, right? Uh, God made us and the angels in his image. Uh, we, you know, that image of God is um, seen in the fact that we're self-aware. We have imagination. We have memory. We have purpose. We, you know, have, have reason. Um, we're spiritual and immortal. These are all different parts of it. But again, God made us to be like him in these ways. And he also made the angels like this. But he made us this way for a specific reason. So that we could see his glory. Again, not because God needed an audience, but it's so that we would be blessed by seeing his glory. Also so that we might know him. And that we might worship him. And that we might have fellowship with him. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden. That was God's original purpose for mankind. And, and the work of redemption reverses the effects of the fall and brings us back into that fellowship with God. So the Lord has given to us a great blessing to make us in his image so that we can have those things that he has promised to us. And, and of course, that would exclude the animal kingdom. It, that sets us apart. We're not animals. We're, rational, we're not rational animals, so to speak. We are different from the animals because we are made in God's image. Now, eighth, we saw God is morally good. Remember, he gave us a conscience that rewards us when we do what's good, but makes us feel guilty when we do what's wrong. And um, that's exactly what the Bible tells us, is that God is good. And the ultimate expression of that is holy. Remember, holy means God loves what is good perfectly. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. David writes in Psalm 11, verse 7, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Remember what righteousness is? It's what is right. God loves what is right. And what is right is what is loving, what is good, what is holy. Now, because God is holy and only the upright will behold his face, God was willing out of his great love to send his son to make us holy. I mean, think about this. Without holiness, we would never see the Lord. Without holiness, we would only be looking forward to eternal destruction in hell. But God, out of his love, has made it possible for us to be holy. And, and once giving us his Holy Spirit to make us holy, now we love holiness. We love what is right. We love what is good. And the idea <clears throat> of being, you know, just full of the, of the, the love of evil is, is repugnant to us. So again, God, out of his mercy, makes a way possible for us to be transformed, to reverse the effects of the fall in us, and to make us like Christ. He makes us positionally holy through the obedience and sacrifice of Christ, which we were looking at this morning, and also we saw this morning, he makes us personally holy by giving us his Holy Spirit to work Christ's nature in us so that God can embrace us, so that we can stand in his presence and be his forever. 
Now, ninth, we saw that he must be benevolent because he gives us much more pleasure than pain. And that's exactly what we see Jesus telling us about him. And, of course, we've experienced it in our own lives. But in Luke 6, verse 35, Jesus says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, for you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So where does all this pleasure that we experience come from? It comes from the hand of God. As James reminds us, again, we've read this once before, James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And again, that uh, benevolence of God is the reason why there's a Savior. I already mentioned that earlier and this morning. When God so loved the world, He loved the world, the fallen world, with the love of benevolence. It's out of His kindness and His mercy, purely within Himself, that He sent His Son into the world to make us truly lovely. Tenth, we saw that He is angry. We see the signs of His displeasure in the creation, and this is where our text reminds us that I read earlier in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So God is revealing his anger from day to day because of how mankind responds to his kindness, to his mercy, to the fact that he is. They don't give him thanks, they don't worship him and so forth. What we need to be thankful for is that God has poured out his anger and his wrath upon Jesus for our sins so we have escaped. God is no longer angry with us. But for those who don't put their trust in Him, He will pour it out on them, which is the reason why if, you know, if we're to love our neighbor, we need to get the message out to them of how they might escape. And let's not forget, God is going to bring His elect into the kingdom. And they're, they're relatively few compared to the number of people there are in the world, so we don't expect everybody to turn, but there will be some who will. Eleventh, we saw he is just, being good, he must punish the wrong. And that's why we see the signs of his displeasure. Uh, when Abraham was praying for his nephew Lot, who was down in Sodom and didn't want to see Lot get destroyed with everyone else, uh, Abraham said to the Lord in Genesis 18, verse 25, Far be it from you to do such a thing to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike, far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And of course, he will, and he did, and he spared Lot. Okay, now God cannot overlook evil because he is holy and he is just. He must punish it. It's not a choice in, on the part of God, it's his nature. But again, having punished our sins in Christ, we need to be thankful that He will never revisit those sins, that we are forever forgiven. And then finally, with regard to these attributes, before we turn to comparative religion, which will be relatively brief, uh, He must want us to turn from the wrong that we're doing. Okay? He must want us to repent because He's given us a conscience to, that warns us, makes us feel you know, miserable when we do what's wrong. And, He's giving us time to do something about it. Well, that's exactly what we see God is like. God says through Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18, verse 23, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? God does not delight in the destruction of his image. Okay? And again, it would take a little while to explain how that coincides with the fact that God doesn't choose everyone. But it's simply to say that considered in and of itself, God considering one creature made in his image suffering, he takes no pleasure in that. But as Jonathan Edwards would say, in that his justice is glorified, in bringing this wrath upon this person who would not repent and who sinned against him, against infinite love, well, God delights in that. Peter also writes this in 2 Peter 3.9, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some 
count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And again, just reflecting the same idea that we saw in Ezekiel. And we do need to remember that God was patient toward us when we were outside of Christ. He didn't judge us right away, did He? But very patiently led us to repentance and faith, though we had done, we had done many things contrary to His will that provoked Him. And this, I think, is encouragement for us, hope for us, that our children may yet, by God's grace, come to faith in Christ. God is giving them time to repent. As long as they're alive, the possibility is still there. Okay, so what we've seen so far, and this is the main point, okay, we've seen that the God who reveals Himself in nature is the same God who reveals Himself in the Bible. The two revelations agree perfectly and not surprisingly because Jesus did say the Bible is God's Word. So secondly, I want us to just briefly compare what other religions have to say uh, about God. And thankfully, as I mentioned before, there aren't that many. I mean, yes, there are, there are hundreds. I don't know how many religions there are in the world. But there aren't that many who claim to believe in God and claim to have a revelation from Him. There's really only two, and that is Judeo-Christianity, and by saying Judeo, I'm including the Jews in that, and Hinduism, you know, the, the two main competing religions. Now, why, what complicates things, of course, is there are many different religions that don't believe in a God, that are pantheistic, or that believe that, you know, like the trees are gods, or the rocks are gods, or somehow there's spirits that live in there. That, that's animism is something totally different. Um, and um, there's a lot of Christian cults, and it seems to multiply religions, okay? And that, I think, is um, one of the things that we can use to kind of narrow it down, okay? Heretical offshoots from true Christianity. Now, one thing I thought was kind of interesting is that um, it, it is true that there are offshoots of other religions, but it does seem as though the main religions are offshoots of Christianity, heretical deviations. And I think that we can use that as an argument in favor of Christianity because what religion would Satan be more apt to attack? The one that he inspired <laughs> or the only one he didn't, you know, which is Christianity. That's why there are so many different variations and also why there are, you know, one of the reasons why there's so many different splinters within the Protestant movement itself, though thankfully we all hold to a common core of belief, what we call the fundamentals. So let me just quickly then for our purposes this evening focus on two cults, Islam and Mormonism, both of which use the Bible, uh, though they see it as corrupted, and they have their own religious writings, the, you know, Islam has the Quran and uh, Mormons have the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, and I think they have, there was another document that I came in contact with that I wasn't familiar with, and I didn't put the name down here. But anyway, since these two religions are loosely based on the Bible, we should expect to see some similarities, and actually we find more in Islam than we do in Mormonism, with, with what we believe, okay? And then there's Hinduism. You know, the second great competing religion, and that's really just all over the map. Well, first of all, let's consider Islam. And let me just say a few things briefly about it. Okay, Islam agrees that God is eternal, that God is timeless. They believe He's infinite in all of His attributes. They believe He is one. They're, they're very dogmatic about that. They deny the Trinity, okay, and that's a deviation from the Scripture. By the way, I never, maybe I didn't mention this, but maybe I could just briefly. John Gerstner, uh, who was a uh, natural theologian, like R.C. Sproul, apologist, believed that the Trinity that could be demonstrated through natural revelation. And the way he did it, a couple of different ways, I'll just give you one. He said that one of the perfections, one thing that we would consider to be a perfection is harmony. And for there to be harmony, there has to be more than one party. And so, if harmony is perfection, then God must have that perfection. 
And if there is to be harmony in God, there must be a plurality of, of persons in the Godhead. It doesn't specify how many. And then there's another argument that he uses that's kind of interesting. He believes that God patterned the human family after um, the Trinity. And um, that, that's, that's, I don't know, it's possible, I suppose. But um, the Father loves the Son, and in their love for one another, the, the generation of the Holy Spirit eternally, um, he believes he sees, you know, a, a shadow of that in the human family. And a husband loves his wife, and the love between them creates um, a, a child. Anyway, I'll just leave that <laughs> where it is. Okay. Islam also believes God is independent. They believe he's immutable. Here's a quote from one Islamic website. It is determined in the rules of the religion and the judgments of the sound mind that Allah, the exalted, does not change. <laughs> okay? They believe that he is the creator, that he created the heavens and the earth in six days, although like modern, you know, some often liberal thought, but not always liberal thought. They believe that each of these days is is a different period of time, and some of them are 50,000 years, and others are perhaps longer or shorter periods of time. They believe that God is personal. Actually, they don't believe He's personal. They believe that, that He transcends personality. So then, obviously, the question that R.C. would ask is, is, is this, transcend, this, this state He's in of transcending personal, is it personal or impersonal? So they probably, he seems to be relating to mankind as a person. They believe he's good, but not in the way the Bible defines goodness. Here's a quote. As Allah has the highest degree of every kind of virtue and perfection, he is naturally free from every fault, defect, and deficiency. Now that's from their perspective. The question is, how does he measure up? To God's perspective, well, they believe that the faithful Muslim who achieves heaven, achieves of heaven that is full of sensual delight, but it's only for men, okay? So it's, you know, a male-dominated religion. There's really nothing for women, and what men get when they go into heaven is everything they wanted on earth with regard to immorality. Um, I, I did read some things I won't repeat because it didn't, um, it's not something we should really even think about, but um, it, it is an immoral heaven. Benevolence, Islam teaches that God is kind and merciful to people, uh, that He's beneficent, all loving, merciful, and forgiving, but there is an exception, and the exception is the infidel. He's not kind to the infidel. They believe He's angry, okay? Faithful Muslims should kill the infidel, the unbeliever. Now, many of them deny that, but that is, in fact, what the Quran teaches. They believe that Allah is just. They believe in a day of judgment when everyone's going to be judged for the actions, their actions in this life. And again, those who followed his directions will be rewarded with sensual paradise, those men, okay? But those who rejected him and his ways will be punished with hell. And as you remember, you know, the God of Islam doesn't really require that much when you think about it. The five pillars, you know, that's not that uh, difficult to achieve. But it's works, okay, not grace. And they believe he's patient, that he, they believe he wants man to repent, but again, in their own way. Now, as you can see, there are similarities in their understanding of God's natural attributes, but there's significant differences when it comes to His morality. But why the similarity? Well, it's because they share the same book. They, they hold to the Old and New Testament, and they pick and choose what pieces they, they want. And let's not forget, you know, they do have a works-based salvation. The Bible condemns that. They do deny the Trinity. They believe God is absolutely one. They, don't, they deny Jesus as God, they believe He's a prophet, not as great as Muhammad. And they believe that the Holy Spirit is the angel Gabriel. That's interesting. Um, but again, not what the Bible teaches. Now, again, I spent a little bit more time on this one because their view of God is more similar to ours than the ones that follow. So let's quickly just look at Mormonism. <laughs> Mormonism. Okay, we, what do they think about God? Is He eternal? No. 
Now, this one statement summarizes everything they believe about God, and it essentially answers all the other questions. They say this, as man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. Have you ever seen the Godmakers or the Temple of the Godmakers, the, the, the documentaries that were made of the Mormon church? It's, it's quite, um, quite revealing. But they believe that the God who created this universe is one among many gods, uh, innumerable gods, and that that God was once a man and that he worked his way to godhood, being created by another god who put him on a planet, he worked his way to godhood, now he creates another world full of people, and there's going to be people in that world that are going to work their way to godhood. And you can only do it, of course, in the Mormon church. So is their God eternal? No. Is he infinite? No, because the finite cannot become infinite. Plus, they believe in many gods, innumerable gods, and they would necessarily limit each other. Is he one? No. But he's the only one with which they have to do. But again, there's many, many other gods. Is he independent? No, he depends on the God who created him. Is he unchangeable? Well, let me ask. He was once a man and now he's God. Is he unchangeable? Of course not. Is he the creator? Yes, they would say of this universe. Is he personal? Well, he was once one of us, so he's personal. Is he good? Not by God's standards. You know, when they practice polygamy, it's, again, a man-based religion. So Mormons believed in polygamy. They would marry all these wives, and uh, those wives had to please the husband because on the day of resurrection, when that husband would come out of the grave first, then he could decide which of his wives were going to rise. So you better treat him nicely while you're in this world. And uh, he had a multiplicity of wives because he needed many of them to populate his planet. So that, that's... That's what Mormonism is all about. Is, is he good? No, not good, not by God's standards. Is he benevolent? Well, I'm sure he does some good things. Is he angry? They believe sometimes. Is he just? No, not by God's standards. Patient? No, well, possibly. But again, from what we've seen, the God of Mormonism cannot be the God who is revealed in nature since the God that is revealed in the creation is eternal, infinite, unchangeable, and independent. The Mormon God is not. Now, with regard to Hinduism, I just have a couple things to say. <laughs> we don't have to spend much time on this because there is no general consensus of what Hinduism believes, um, what they believe God is. I mean, some of them believe there are many gods, but only one God with which they have to do, kind of like Mormonism, only these gods didn't come from men. So many gods, but we worship one God. Some believe there are many gods and, um, and goddesses, and they're all to be worshipped. Some of them believe there's only one God. Others believe in pantheism, that God is the created, or excuse me, is the universe. Okay? So they lack a clear idea of what God is, perhaps because they lack a clear revelation from God, perhaps their sacred writings simply disagree, but from what we understand, what they believe about God, it does not agree with what we know about God from the creation. So this, this is the conclusion, this is the bottom line. The God we see in creation is the God we see in the Bible, which further supports what Jesus tells us about the Bible, that the Bible is God's Word, His self-disclosure, His self-revelation to us. Now, that, that's the whole point, okay? So, we don't have really too many religions that believe in a, in a God, and among those that do and believe that God has spoken to them, the writings do not agree with what we see in the creation. Okay, we, we could, of course, uh, look at the Jehovah's Witnesses, but um, I think, again, what they believe, works-based salvation, um, anti-Trinitarian. Um, I don't think they have the top-notch top theologians in their camp. But anyway, Christianity, the, the Bible, as God has given it to us, not, not the perverted version that the Jehovah's Witnesses use, reveals to us the God we see in the creation. So we can use that as an argument for the Bible being God's revelation to us.
All right, so again, Jesus tells us it's the Word of God. He's divinely credentialed by God to tell us this. We're going to see other things. Uh, next week, we want to look at prophecy. Uh, we looked at one. We'll review that in the series that R.C. Sproul did for us, but we want to look at other fulfilled prophecy. And I think we'd all admit, if the Bible clearly predicts something hundreds or thousands of years, even decades before it takes place, that it demonstrates to us that there is a supernatural author to the Bible. So again, many proofs to show us that the Bible is His Word. Well, that's where we're going to end for this evening. Let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to uh, just to apply some of the things that we've seen about God's attributes and how those attributes really secure us because of God's grace and mercy towards us.